So there's this promise that Jesus gives to his disciples that is a really, really hard thing to wrap your mind around at first, and maybe even harder thing to actually believe and, and place your faith or trust in. I'll, I'll read it to you. It comes out of John chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 5, five 6, and 7. There he says this, I am going away to him who sent me, meaning the Father, his, his heavenly Father, uh, God in heaven. He is God the Son, but he's going back to God the Father. I'm going away to him who sent me. And and not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will, will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. So you have this this promise that Jesus makes. He says, I'm going back to the Father, and I'm going to send this counselor or this comforter, this Holy Spirit, to to be with you. And it's actually to your benefit that I go away. And that's why I say it's it's really hard to to trust that, to believe that. Because if we're honest, I think a lot of us don't haven't really ra- wrestled with that, haven't really grappled with that truth. And if you listen to to some preachers, uh, I think I was even guilty of this as a younger preacher myself. We'll, we'll often use this kind of idea of being with Jesus as almost like a, a guilting or shaming method to spur people on to action, right? We might say things like, could you imagine, would you, would you be doing the things you're doing now if Jesus was here with you in the flesh? But Jesus actually says it's to our benefit that he goes away because we now have the Holy Spirit. We have this counselor. Uh, other times we might look at the apostles and, and look at them with shame and say like, man, they were with Jesus in the flesh and still Peter does these foolish things. But the reality is, again, it's to our benefit. It's to their benefit that he went away because he sent this counselor, this Holy Spirit. Think of a counselor, somebody who gives you advice, who leads you, who guides you. And the counselor is better. It's to our benefit to Jesus. Uh, It's to our benefit that Jesus went to be with the Father because he gave us this counselor. Because while he was on earth, he was confined to one location where this counselor is actually present and everybody who trusts in Christ at the same time. So I, I lead with that because I think it's a helpful backdrop for the text we're going to be in today because it talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. And I think it's interesting to, to juxtapose that idea that it's to our benefit that the Spirit's with us now. Now, now to be sure, one day we will be with Jesus in uh, glorified bodies where we're free even from the presence of sin, and that will be great. That will be better than the Holy Spirit. But for now, it's to our benefit. It's to the benefit of the church that the Holy Spirit is with us. Against that that backdrop, let's jump into Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to close out chapter 2 today, so it's been a a journey through Ephesians so far. We'll be uh, through the first third of the book after today. We'll be through chapters 1 and 2. And so join with me in in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. There it says this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's the word of the Lord this morning. Paul starts this this letter out. Again, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, this early church that he helped uh, establish. He's writing to them, and he, he makes this transition. He says, so then, so uh, if you've been paying attention, following with us here through Ephesians, in chapter 2, there's kind of three little scenes. There's what we were in Christ, what we once were. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. We we were uh, alienated from, from God. We we were hostile towards him. We were children of wrath, of disobedience, he said. So that's what we once were. And then last Sunday, we kind of looked at what Christ has done. So Christ did amazing things. He accomplished this work on the cross to then kind of change our status. So what we once were, what Christ did, and now today is... Uh, who we are now, like who Christ has made us, what he is making us into. And that's this big, these two words, so then, is a big deal. It's going into this idea of what we no longer are, big, important words. So I kind of want to walk through this text here. I want to start by talking about our status. I'm going to talk about our status here. And, and Paul kind of lays out these three things that we are now in Christ because of what he's done. Those three things are that, that we're a kingdom, we're a family, and we're a temple. Those three things are right here in our text. When when we talk about being a kingdom, it's because if you look there, 
He says we're citizens. He, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens. A citizen is somebody who is a, uh, uh, has rights within a, a country or a, a, a proximity, right? A, uh, a, a country or continent. You're a citizen there uh, with the saints. So we talked about saints. We kind of unpacked that early on. Like the first verse was who Paul is writing to is the saints at Ephesus. A saint, uh, what I had said then, and I'll say again now, just a helpful way to remember it is, uh, there are some traditions that would say a saint is somebody who actually had to have like confirmed perform a miracle and then be confirmed. But we said that a saint is not somebody who's performed a miracle, but they've been a recipient of a miracle. So Jesus has uh, helped them to be born again. The Spirit has uh, has allowed them to be born again to a living hope in Christ. They responded to Christ in faith, and that's a miracle. Uh, they received a miracle from Christ by believing in Him. They didn't perform a miracle. For their own benefit or something that they did but it's all that what happened to them what, what happened to them is they were saved by christ they were the recipient of this miracle not the performer of the miracle so that makes you a saint anybody who's trusted in christ is a saint everybody and so you are now fellow citizens with the saints so a citizen has the rights it's no longer you're no longer a stranger you're not a refugee or an immigrant somebody who's just temporarily passing by you are a citizen of this coming kingdom We've talked a little bit about the kingdom before, and what that is, is it's a coming thing. There's this kind of now and not yet. It's not fully realized here. We're waiting for Jesus to usher that in. That's why he teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're, we're still asking for it to be on earth as it is in heaven. We are we are a part of that agent bringing that kingdom here. Uh, we're, we're citizens of that coming kingdom. You experience glimpses of it here on this earth while sin is still present. Uh, the greatest glimpse being that of the church itself gathered for worship on a Sunday. is one of the greatest and, and biggest uh, glimpses of this coming kingdom that we could get. So we're citizens of that coming kingdom. We are citizens of that now. We have those full rights. We're not just strangers and aliens anymore. And then we're also members of God's household. So we're part of this kingdom. We're part of this family because of what God has done. We're a, house, we're a part of his household of God. Now, now I love this idea. Uh, I never get over it. Probably you haven't either if you've trusted in him, which is if you can think of this idea of being uh, adopted into God's family when you were once an enemy or once a, a trespasser, a sinner under the wrath of God, but now you've been brought into his household, his family, that's an amazing thing because you think of like if you, because we were strangers, if if a stranger did something really bad, actually, let's let's make it you. If you did something grievous, like something really bad to somebody, say you stole a lot of money or, or you injured or killed somebody's family member, and then they came to you and said, you know what, you're forgiven. You'd feel probably a little embarrassed, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to stick around. But when God makes you a part of his household, he says, not only are you forgiven for slandering me, for blaspheming me, all these things that you should be crushed for, that you should be uh, destroyed for, right? You should perish because of all of the sins you've committed against God. He's, he doesn't just say, you, you're forgiven. Uh, I'm, I'm ripping up the ticket. You don't have to pay the penalty. You just walk out of the court. But he says, you're actually not only forgiven, but now I want you to be a part of my family. Come, come over for dinner afterwards. If you've ever been in that situation with a stranger where you've been a, an offending party, it's a little awkward, right? But God is, he embraces us. He says, you're now a part of my family. That's amazing. That's, that's life-changing. We're now members of God's household, his his family. Now, I'm trying to get better about not always overwhelming people with books to read, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna assign a whole book. But what I would love for you to do, I think you would actually find this incredibly life giving to your faith. Uh, it, it's going to be a classic, I think, even though the author is technically still alive, but he's getting up there in age. J.R. Packer has a book called Knowing God, a, a really well known loved book, and he has a chapter in it on adoption which to me was just one of the most encouraging books in all of Christian literature I've maybe ever read. It's a little longer, maybe 20, 30 pages, but you should read his book, uh, his chapter on adoption in the book, Knowing God. So we're citizens, we're members, and then we're also a temple. We're, we're a temple, he calls us that, which is the dwelling place for God. And that's an Old Testament image of there was this temple, this building that David wanted to make for God so God had a place to live. But God says to David, uh, I don't I don't live in places made by human hands, but now he's saying that we are the temple. He's making us with his hands so he can dwell within his people, within the church. This uh, In the Old Testament, you had his chosen people who would go to experience his presence in the temple, and now in the New Testament, his church is that temple where the, the presence of God is to be experienced. When people come into our midst, they're supposed to recognize, uh, 
a palpable, tangible presence of God through our actions, through our worship, because we worship the true God. That's why uh, at Engage Albany, there's really four elements that should be exemplified in the church service, I think, if you were to read through scripture, and that's that's the preaching and teaching of the word of God. We are we are word-centric at Engage Albany. Uh, it's, it's the singing back to God because we worship him. Uh, we are commanded to sing, and it's actually really life-giving to us to, to give him the, the glory he is due. And then there's also uh, the Lord's Supper. He commanded us to do that. Baptism, when you have candidates for baptism to be entered into that family of God, to be affirmed that God has done a work in their life. But the Lord's Supper, that's commanded as well to do. Um, it's it's the gospel in miniature, kind of in like performance art, to, to remind us what Christ has done for us and of our unity through his body. And then the, the last thing is prayer. Uh, I once heard somebody say we should pray. We should pray long enough in a church service that it would make uh, unbelievers just a little bit uncomfortable because we think God is real and we we want to talk to Him because we believe He He hears our prayers and that that uh, helps us to have dependence upon Him. So those kind of four things we want to uh, embrace. All of those things we're not ashamed of them, embarrassed of them. Uh, I actually believe if a if a non Christian comes to a church service, you've already won a lot of the battle. They expect it to seem like a church service. I know some churches have grown fond of playing songs from uh, pop music, uh, non-Christian songs, but I don't really see the place for that in a Christian worship service because the church should act like the church. It should be about God and not about us and not about making us uh, comfortable or making us consumers, but about making us worshipers and bringing us into that idea. So uh, we're citizens, we're members, and we are a temple in the world, a dwelling place for God. People should experience that when they come into our midst. So, so that's our status as Christians as these people. So now that's our status. And then I want to talk about our structure. And, and by structure, I mean building there. Because if you look in verse 20, it says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This, this word foundation, it's the concrete part of a building, right? So if a building is made out of brick and mortar or, or wood, the bottom part, the, the poured cement is the foundation. So much so that if you've ever been in the market for buying a house, house hunting, uh, they'll tell you if a if a house has a cracked or, or damaged foundation, the, the rest of the house is pretty much is good for nothing. That's the most important part because it serves all of the rest. And so that's why it's so important that our foundation is is right, is true, is accurate, why we test that foundation. The household of God is built on, on this foundation. And it tells us here that that foundation is the apostles and the prophets. So so in the Old Testament, you had prophets. They were the mouthpieces of God. They they foretold, they, uh, or forth told rather, they weren't always predicting the future, but really reminding people of what God had already revealed to tell them uh, who he was, tell, tell God's people about God so that they would worship him correctly and obey his commands. That's what the, the purpose of the prophets were in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, the apostles came, they walked with Jesus in the, in the flesh, that's what an apostle was, and then they became the teachers of the church and, and wrote our New Testament books as well. So you have the prophets writing most of the Old Testament, the apostles writing most of the New Testament. That's the foundation of the church. Now, I have to get a little teachery on you here for a moment and, and teach some things here. So this idea of uh, the foundation of the church is really important to unpack. So uh, I want to back uh, go back in history a little bit here to the fourth century. There's a, a church controversy. So the first five, six hundred years of church, uh, they really ironed out a lot of uh, controversies or heresies that kind of sprung up so they could understand what the scriptures taught and obey them and where people deviated to kind of protect what God had revealed there. So this is maybe the most one of the most heartbreaking controversies of church history. It's called the Donatist controversy. And, and let me give you kind of the background here. So Christians living under uh, Emperor Diocletian, who, who was a persecutor of the church, you, you have these really heartbreaking situations where he might come into a church, and back then they didn't have a printing press, so so one church of 100 people might only have one Bible because they're very costly things. They might come to the to a pastor of the church who, who loves his people, but also loves God, and that's really what he's devoted his life to, is connecting those two things, and they might say to him, hey, give us the Bible, or we're going to kill some of your people, you know, give like, we'll kill Mary, or give us the Bible choose. And so he's kind of put between this rock and a hard place. And see, what happened as this went on for a while, over time, uh, then persecution stopped, and you had this mess. You had these people, these 
people who may have been, they may have, they called them like the giver overs. The, there's a word tratador, which meant like you gave it over, you gave over the scripture. So you compromised. Others were, were hardcore and maybe, maybe blood was shed because they wouldn't compromise the scriptures, which it's such a hard thing to think like, how, how could you choose, right? You want to see people die, but I mean, they're going to go to heaven, right? If they know Christ. So, so you see why people, controversy, persecution often incites emotive responses. So after persecution kind of ended, you had these groups of people. You had some people who had kind of come back and said, like, hey, we, we buckled under pressure. People told on us, and then we got in trouble, or we told on neighbors so we could have mercy for ourselves. And now we want to come back to the church. And so some people would welcome them back. But this guy, Donatus, was really hardcore, and he would not allow that sort of thing to happen. And he kind of came up with this. He started teaching, and others started following back then that if you were of this sect where somebody had uh, compromised, they'd given up the scriptures, then a, a lot of your ministry was invalidated. So where it really got tricky was not even so much for those people who had compromised, but for those that they discipled. So for example, say say I was baptized by, by Bill, and uh, Bill ended up compromising faith, giving away his copy of the scriptures under persecution, and and then they would come to me and say, Sean, you... Uh, your baptism is not valid. You're actually, uh, your salvation is suspect because you came from this line of a guy who was a traitor. So you see this really interesting implication that comes here. And this all ties into some really important doctrines. So there are, even to this day, there are movements that would say that our, our lineage is traced all the way back through the apostles. And see, that's how we would be a little bit different than someone like Roman Catholics, per se, who would say, We've always had this succession going back to the original apostles, where part of the the Protestant Reformation. I don't I don't like to use the word Protestant because I'm, we're not protesting. Uh, Luther did not want to protest. He wanted to reform. He wanted to come under. He wanted to be submitted to authority of Scripture and and bring it back to where it had been maybe deviated. So we're not protesting. We're we're submitting to God. We're we're reforming. So so for those of us in that tradition. Um, it's very important that we submit not to the moral character of the apostles. We're, we're not looking to a, a unblemished history of apostles as the foundation of our faith. We're looking to the truth of their teachings, the apostolic succession of their teachings. So wherever men have erred, and Paul kind of talked about this to the church in Timothy, and let, uh, to the church at Corinth, let, let God be true, though every man be a liar. If we're looking, if our salvation, if our faith, if receiving grace from God is dependent upon the perfection or our moral uprightness of those who train us, that puts us in a really shaky, dangerous place. So be encouraged, church. Be encouraged, engaged, that you, your faith is dependent on the, the foundation being the teaching of the apostles, of the prophets, not their upright character. If you study the prophets at all in the Old Testament, you'll see that they all do some really foolish things, some really sinful things. And so... Thankfully, we don't have to depend on, on their integrity, but we have to depend on the, the truth of the words they taught and spoke. So that is our foundation, our apostolic succession. You may hear that. Maybe if you ever debate a Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, uh, we submit to the apostolic succession of the teaching, not of the moral uprightness of those who came before us. And I'm so thankful for that because what if somebody that, uh, one of the mentors that have spoken into my life, Tomorrow decided he was going to embezzle money and went to prison, and you know he lost his, his ordination and credentials. Then would I be in trouble for that? Thankfully, I would not, because my, my salvation is based on the teaching and not on the work of uh, or the moral uprightness of those who came before me. And then Paul kind of starts to to mix the metaphor in the last verse here. The the structure itself is is not a brick and mortar building but it is, in fact, the actual people themselves. Uh, the church is organized, yes, it, it, it does has, have structure, but much more than being uh, an organization, it's an organism. It, it's alive. I'll, I'll say that again because I, I think it's important to understand that the church is organized. It should have order. God is a God of order, and we should, should not be haphazard in how we operate as a church. We should be organized, but more than being organized is, is being an organism. We, we are a living organism. It's not just a building, but it's the people. I know people are saying that a lot now during 
uh, quarantine during coronavirus that the church is a people, and I hope we will rise to that occasion to be the people of God. Uh, but it's it's important to understand that truth is a scriptural one, that we are an organism and much more than an organization. Uh, listen to the way that another apostle, the apostle Peter, says this in one of his letters. This is in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 6. There he says, As you come to him, Jesus, a living stone, rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. It's a really amazing truth, and I think it's important to, to stop and, and talk about that just for a minute, because it's really amazing that that Peter refers to the people in God's church as living stones. Uh, as I took our boys, uh, my two boys love to, to throw rocks into the river. So we did that today. The weather was nice. We went outside. To, we kept their social distance, but went to a, a river. We just throw throw rocks in the river. They could do that for hours. And in scripture, stones are something that they use often. They would stack stones as a, as a memorial to remember an amazing thing that God did in their life, a place where he met them. Peter is saying that we are stones, we are memorials to tell and testify to people what God has done, what he is doing, what he's, what he's done in our lives. And, and it's amazing that Peter himself writes this because if you'll remember, uh, at one point Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? He says, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the, the Lord. And Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, people didn't reveal it, but my Father in heaven revealed that to you. It was a miracle that, that Peter believed in him. And then he says, your name is Peter or rock. And on this rock, his, his name is a play in words. Peter sounds like rock in the Greek. He says, and on this rock, I will build my church, which is amazing because if he it kind of emphasizes our point here about the importance of the teaching and not on the life of the apostle itself, is that I think what, what Peter, what Jesus was actually saying to Peter is that I will build my church on your confession, on your confession of me being the Messiah, because only through God saving somebody will anybody be able to do that. God has to reveal it to them, and that is that is how the church would be built. That is the living stone. Because later Peter actually denies Jesus to a little girl. Uh, he's he's terrified of this little girl apparently and denies Jesus. Um, so we see even he wobbles, but his confession, uh, the the truth of who Jesus is, never changes. So we talked about a little bit about kind of this idea of this structure. We talked about our status and our structure, and I want to talk a little bit about our security. And, and what I mean by that is the Holy Spirit. That's the last word of our text here. Uh, we are the dwelling place for God, and so we have this security. We are we are safe and secure in, in his hands. We don't have to worry about whether or not we belong to God, because we are sealed by him. God takes residence in us. Uh, we would have discussed this a, a bit back in uh, chapter 1, verse 13, where it talks about being sealed by the Holy Spirit, but I want to mention it again here. The application being that we're, we're the dwelling place of God, uh, we, we can't lose that because we did nothing to uh, earn our salvation. We can do nothing to lose our salvation if we're truly uh, born again of that Spirit. Uh, I know some of us struggle with, with knowing whether or not we are saved. Uh, every time we sin, it weighs heavily on us, but, but here's this amazing good news about the gospel. Having a, a sensitivity about sin is actually, in fact, a, a strong indicator that you are probably, in fact, saved. I'll repeat that as well. Uh, having a, a sensitivity about your sin is actually a pretty strong indicator that you are, in fact, saved. Uh, because the Holy Spirit dwells in you, it doesn't want to inhabit the same place or the same person as sin. So what are you doing? Let me ask you, what, what are you doing about your sin? Are you, you walking with others? Are you confessing that? We weren't meant to go the Christian life alone. Uh, sin seeks to destroy you. Uh, we have real enemies that want to see you uh, shipwreck your faith, who want to see you living in sin and not living in, in victory, living in uh, joy that comes from being free and uh, walking in transparency with community. We want to create this environment, this culture at Engage, where it's okay to struggle, where it's okay to be honest, because our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. Uh, 
our enemy is somebody who, who wants to see us destroyed. Um, we want to fix our gaze upon Jesus together so that we could overcome sin that, that drags us down. You're, you're never more free than when you have nothing to hide. What if I told you that because God has already claimed you as his own and set you free from sin and sent his spirit to dwell inside of you, uh, that you are free to stop the introspection of your own life and, and you can start living to serve joyfully, uh, knowing everything is already accomplished for you in Christ. You can actually serve him with joy, which actually is a pretty good segue into my next point, which is our service. So we talked about uh, our security. Before that, we talked about our structure, our status, and now I want to talk about our service. So if you look in that last verse, it says, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The first three chapters, the first half of Ephesians, is a little light on application, but here's here's something for free out of here. Uh, being built, God is building us to this dwelling place for the Spirit where he wants to indwell, but also he wants us to be co-laborers with him. He wants us to be builders as well. So I want, I want to cast a little bit of vision about kind of my hope, my prayers as a pastor for a, a church in New York's capital city, Albany, is just to take root here, uh, to be here a long time and invest. That's It, it takes time. Uh, anyone who's ever tried to build anything realizes it doesn't happen overnight. So we want to be a part of ushering in God's shalom, of his kingdom. That, that, that means peace, but even greater, a, a deeper, bigger peace than, than anything we've ever experienced uh, apart from Christ, apart from what God could do. We want to be a part of building a, a, a counterculture amidst the culture that exists here already. We want to bless uh, this city and see that spread to other cities. We want to see other churches built up. Um, we want to see people empowered to, to just co-create alongside God. We're not just looking to to, to harbor and uh, hold on to our resources, but to send them back out. We want to create, uh, I'm praying that musicians will rise up that will create new uh, songs and hymns and spiritual songs that would bless our church community, but also could be shared with others. Uh, because life is worship, and we want to be a part of creating beautiful worship hymns that honor and glorify God and reveal Him as He truly is. Uh, we already have a lot of artists in this church, which I'm super thankful for. I thank God for that. I want to see them empowered to use their gifts, uh, blessing those around us. We people are are designed to like and enjoy the beauty of creation, and uh, and we are created to be creative as well because God is creative. God who makes us, and then we want to be. So uh, I want to see artists uh, sent out from the church to bless the community and to start dialogues with people out there. And I'm so thankful that we have some of them already. And then uh, I want us to be a church of, uh, of welcoming hospitality. And that's really way in text. I think that's actually kind of the heart of this text. Uh, that, that word stranger right there in verse 19. Uh, in Greek, its, it's root word is uh, xeno. Uh, so for example, our English word hospitality comes from this same uh, Greek word, meaning uh, hospitality is xenophile, or, or the love of strangers. Do you see this amazing thing that God did through Christ? He, he loved and made strangers a part of the family of God. So you and I, once we're dead in our sins and trespasses, hostile, enemies of God, children of wrath, and now God has brought us in to make us citizens, to make us family, to bring us into his temple. One of the requirements for pastors in, in God's church is that they, they show hospitality or, or that they are hospitable. And this doesn't just mean that they, they love people who share their faith, but that they open their homes and their lives to strangers from outside of their faith, from different worldviews. Uh, pastors are also supposed to serve as examples to the rest of the church. So we, we should really all be doing that as part of being a Christian. Jesus did it for us. He brought us into and welcomed us at his table. So I want to ask you and encourage you, how could you do that? Dur during this time, I know we're not we're not uh, having physical gatherings. It's probably not wise to invite people in your house. But as we start to explore in coming weeks, the idea of starting to open things back up. And as we, we seek to find uh, safe social practices to interact with others, um, do your neighbors know you? Have they ever had a meal at your house? If not, maybe start praying for one or two that could. Uh, you don't have to... You don't have to overwhelm yourself by entertaining uh, every night. In fact, I would say entertaining is something different. It's trying to impress people. You, you want to be hospitable. Um, 
Han and I actually decided a while back that we don't we don't really go too far out of our way to clean up our house because uh, that would be somewhat dishonest because our house we have uh, three soon to be four young kids and so our house is always going to be a little bit messy. Uh, we want to welcome people into our lives, not just try to impress them and entertain them. We want to be hospitable. We want to be true, authentic. We want to have, share our life with people. H- how could you do the same? And I do want to encourage, I got a couple people in mind as a pastor that I know actually do this really well already, uh, engage. And I just want to, I want to thank you for doing that and tell you that God sees that. Uh, he is pleased that you are following him and doing that work. That's our service. Builders. Hospitality. Let's create that that culture here at this church. And then from our service, I want to land the plane here. Our, and this is our sorrowful Savior. The cornerstone. Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the, the part of the building that they put down first. It kind of sets the tone for the whole rest of the building, which direction it would go, how, how it's laid out. Uh, and a lot of buildings where they'll, they'll carve the date that the, the building was started. Like some buildings take years to complete. And that... That cornerstone, Jesus, is the, the most important piece of the building. He sets the tone for everything else. He gives us our direction. But the amazing thing is there are so many places in Scripture where it talks about this cornerstone and that it was the one that was rejected by the builders. So we talk about God being the builder of our temple, that he, of his temple, that we're living stones in that temple. But Jesus himself is the cornerstone of this, of this temple. He, he's the head of the church. He's the cornerstone of the church. He's He's the bottom, the foundation that holds it up, the cornerstone, the most important piece, but he's also the top. He's the one that gives us our, our marching orders. So many times it's mentioned in Scripture that this, this cornerstone was rejected. What, is, what does that mean? It, it, it's tragic. Uh, that's why it's a sorrowful Savior. If you can imagine the sorrow of being rejected. John 1 says that he came to his own people. His own people did not receive him. The, the Jews were waiting for a Messiah. They had they had longed. They had been expecting, anticipating him, and then when he finally came to set them free, they rejected him. And that actually became a blessing for, for those of us, like most of us here, who are not from a Jewish background. Uh, it, it, it then inverted that. It allowed these strangers, these aliens, to now have a seat at that table. Amazing thing, Jesus was rejected so that you and I could be accepted. Uh, Jesus was, he was made a stranger so that we could become the family of God. He was he was out put out so we could be brought in. It's amazing news. That's that's the heart of the gospel. So if you consider yourself a Christian, that that is a follower of Christ, he tells us, he tells you, you are a living stone. This temple, the temple, the very dwelling place of God. It's now people themselves. The the spirit takes residence in you, the very presence of God. This amazing truth, that, that should make a world of difference in our lives. You've heard the saying that people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. It's a, it's a cliche. I, I kind of want to alter this statement here for the people of God. I want to say people who grow stones should live in glass houses. It's, it's corny, I know, but maybe you'll remember it. People who grow stones should live in glass houses. God's, God's people are stones, living stones that make up his dwelling place. And we're told, we're told that the structure is being joined together. It's, it's being united. We want to be united as a, as a church family, we want to celebrate our differences and our diversity, but united in the teaching and agreement in, in what we believe about Christ. Um, and as living stones, uh, we're growing. The structure is being joined together, and it's growing. So, so people who grow stones should live in glass houses. And what I mean by that is, uh, as a living stone, uh, people are watching you. The, the stone is meant to be a, a testimony, a testimony about what God has done. People are watching you. They just are. You can't help it. You can't help what's happening, but, but be aware of it. Live in a glass house. Invite people into your life. You, you've been brought from death to life if you trust in, in Jesus Christ, and people are hyper aware of that. You have joy in Christ that draws attention because people that don't have it either want to know where you got it or they will envy and despise you because they reject its source. They reject that cornerstone. That's that's just truth. Scripture tells us that. So, so I want to encourage you, if you know Jesus Christ, realize what he's done for you. He, he welcomes you into his family. That's our prayer for our young church here, that we'd be a community, a family, uh, that we will welcome others into that family at that table as well. He, he welcomes you to dine at his table. You who were once a stranger from a foreign, hostile country. Uh, as such, you are called to do the same to your neighbors, to strangers. So you are a living stone. Christ is 
building us into the very dwelling place of God. And this house, it should, should be a glass room that people can see into. They should be able to see in and see God's presence in their life. We want to welcome God's presence, and, and there should be an attractiveness to it to draw others in as well. Let's pray that God would do that. All right. Father, we just come to you with uh, open hands. You are the God who builds, and we just pray that you would build us, that you would use us, your living stones, to create this dwelling place that would be attractive to it, the neighborhood, the neighbors, those around us, and the strangers, that you would use us. Um, and with these open hands, we just ask that you would put tools in them so we could be co-builders with you, uh, tools that were made just for us, um, that we would we would love others well. They would be uh, tools that we could use to love strangers and um, to help participate in labor that we would find meaning in, we find satisfaction and joy in the work we do for you. Not to, not to impress you, not to earn your favor, because Jesus did all of that for us, and we thank you for that, that cornerstone that makes us, that makes up this building that you are making. God, build your kingdom here. Uh, would you usher in that kingdom that we long for? Um, we come to you with open hands, and we just ask that we would receive from you, and we do so joyfully. It's all that you want to do. Most of all, God, we need you. We need you, Jesus. Would you give us yourself? It's in your name that we pray. Amen.